What's up, guys? This is Dan Giffen. Just wanted to say thanks for listening to the podcast. Uh, today's podcast is sponsored by Archuria. If you aren't familiar with Archuria's plugins or products, definitely check it out. I fully endorse these guys. They make some of the most incredible software for any kind of synths or keys sounds that you could ever want. But today I want to talk to you about one of their newer plugins. It's called Pigments. It's a modern state-of-the-art virtual instrument. It lets you create some really awesome, exciting, uh, deeply customizable sounds. It has a really nice interface. I've played with it uh, and it just sounds fantastic. It's a twin audio engine, so if you don't know what that means, it just allows you to mix virtual and analog and wavetable oscillators to create the perfect starting point for your patches, for your sounds that you can build from the ground up. You can morph wavetables or import your own samples and wavetables. It's really cool. Pigments, it really combines their passion for vintage FM synthesis and analog sound uh, with a modern wavetable synthesis to create the ultimate software synth. Uh, there's plenty of presets to get you going. Check out the unique sounds. Um, you can go get pigments and do a free trial and check it out at Arturia.com, A-R-T-U-R-I-A.com. Uh, check it out. There's a link in the show notes if you want to go check out this new plugin called Pigments. It's really cool. And that's enough of that. I'm excited for today's podcast with Peter Dyer. Um, speaking of synths, he is a wizard of all sorts. He's got a lot of really great things to share with us today. And here's today's podcast. Hope you enjoy. Thanks for listening, guys. Yeah, welcome everybody to another episode of the Ableton Music Producer Podcast. I'm Dan Giffen. Today, I'm super stoked. We've got a really great guest with us today. Uh, his name is Peter Dyer. He and I met, I don't know, probably four or five months ago at Laura Escudé's Masterclass in LA, which is a really good time. Yeah. Uh, and I got to sit in the hot seat and he drilled me with a lot of Ableton Live questions. It was wonderful. I think yeah. I might have passed, maybe. <laughs> But Good. yeah, no, a little history. Fire. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, but uh, real quick history. So Peter, he's a LA-based keyboardist, producer, sound designer, Ableton Live user, obviously. Uh, his credits are pretty long. Uh, it includes working with Mariah Carey, Adam Lambert, St. Vincent. Uh, he's in the house band for American Idol on ABC, which you probably have heard of. Uh, he co-wrote Avicii's Wake Me Up, uh, Shame On Me, and Flo Rida's uh, Wobble and Can't Believe It. Uh, he's a producer, musical director for several TV shows. He did tour sound design for Katy Perry, Tegan and Sarah, Rita Ora, Miguel. We could just go on. But uh, yeah, man, I'm, I'm glad to have you on the podcast. Thanks for joining. Yeah, problem. Yeah, it's a good time. You're in LA still, right? Yes, sir. Just, I like your studio. I can see in the Thanks, background. Thanks, man. Got a lot of fun toys. Oh, yeah, too many toys. We're trying to get rid of some, actually. So. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're having, like, a garage sale... A garage I, sale, yeah, it'll be the most I'll... expensive rummage sale in Long Beach. <laughs> yeah, let me know. I might come down and okay. maybe get some more toys. <laughs> Not that I need more, but it's just... Yeah. Like, is that a Voyager? A Moog Voyager? There's a Voyager, there? there's a Sub-37, there's a Moog one over here. Mm. Got you, You've got most of the Moog line and Dave Smith lines covered. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> i'm all about it yeah i've yeah. got i got a sub 37 just hanging good. out next to me right now That's i actually saw um well you do a lot of videos and promo videos for a lot of these synthesizer companies like i saw you did one for moog and moog innovation hmm. uh dave smith slash sequential um yeah yeah a lot of good brands oh. it's That's fun cool. it's the videos are usually a byproduct of having like worked on the synths as like a beta tester and a patch designer so. cool cool so yeah. do you do you designed a lot of the patches and the presets then for yeah some i mean there's a pool of you know folks that do it for everything but um <laughs> i've had the privilege of doing that on the last several projects with dave smith and uh moog and so you know you get a prototype or a early beta or something that's got bugs and problems yeah. stuff and you know you get to put our two cents in and some of it makes it, some of it doesn't. And then do you preset design that hopefully people will use and get inspired by. Yeah. No, that's cool, man. I want to hear more about that. Uh, but like first, usually I asked our guests, like, just talk about your musical background. Like, how did you get started with music? And like, where did that lead you to where you're at today? Um, I mean, I did the typical like piano lessons as a kid. Fast forward to college, I was doing jazz stuff in Portland. Um, my jazz band at school and um, then they had a Juno 60 in the closet and um, the band director asked me if I could help 
the guy in the other ensemble get an organ sound out of it. And he was like, yeah, take it home. Uh, you know, figure it out. You're like, <laughs> I was like the closest to a keyboard person at the time. Nice. And uh, I, it never came back. It moved to L.A. with me. Because uh, <laughs> first time Thanks. I told him, you can't get an organ sound out of a Juno 60. Like, not a good yeah. one. And um, from that point on, I just like got obsessed with sense. And that like was a pretty sharp turn from like, a future as a jazz pianist in Portland, Oregon, uh, to being obsessed with synths and them being a crucial part of like my employment for the last 15, 13 years in LA. So oh. it was uh, fortuitous. Yeah. Moved down to LA, went to MI for a year and, uh, got some tours just like dropped out actually. Cause I got a tour with this guy Van Hunt and then, um, Got to know Randy Jackson through that because he managed Van Hunt. And then Mariah was looking for a new band and Randy's involved with that. So yeah. Randy put me on that. And then from that point, my, I guess, industry career started. Yeah. Just kept meeting the right people and yeah. jumping bands and new gigs. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. It seems like there's definitely like, it's a big city, but there's like a small pool of people where everybody just kind of knows somebody. It yeah. Seems like. Like anytime I'm down there, that just seems to be the story. Yeah, most of my work is more or less like because I knew somebody. You know, there's. I mean, you got to be able to play, but um, yeah, it's a small and big community at the same time. For sure. Yeah, and even if you couldn't play, you could probably use some kind of MIDI <laughs> effect in Ableton Live that could help you play. That's right. Bit. Yeah, use the chord or the quantizer. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yep, that's true. <laughs> That's I honestly my music theory is kind of sad, but I find ways to make myself sound like I'm really great at what I do when it comes to no playing. No shame music. in that. <laughs> no shame in that. I'll just stick with drums. It's really, uh-huh. it's easier for me. So, how did that lead you into learning Ableton Live? Like, how did that kind of come? Um, I so in Mariah's band, I started out on like aux keys slash second keys, and um, the uh, playback guy Mike McKnight was like. Uh, been in the playback biz since it was invented um he kind of taught me everything because he had to go do some other work with roger waters uh the big pink floyd tours over the last 15 10 years so he taught me to do mariah's rig and from then on i kind of kept developing that skill set that was in digital performer and um i started doing i was playing keys and doing playback with al black's band and um we do these festivals. This was early on in Alice's career, so we had like the 4 p.m. slot or something. And it was always sunny, you know, like, or storming rain. Not a long sound check, you know, uh, and I'm trying to do playback. And I see these DJs doing like crazy sets on their baseline MacBook that's like eight years old, sun's blasting down, and it's fine. Everything's working fine. Whereas like yeah. I was running DP and it's sputtering on like, the pimped out Mac at the time. (laughs) I was like, screw this. I'm going to, let me learn Ableton. Let me see what this is about. Also, Al liked to jump around a lot. He didn't want to have a strict linear timeline on the songs because it was, we were way more jammy back then. Um, And so Ableton enabled that because he'd like look back and be like, yeah, I don't want to do the bridge. I'm like, okay. And then, you know, we jump ahead or like we loop a chorus or, um, I could just drop Ableton out sometimes if stuff got too hairy because we weren't track dependent, but you know, mm-hmm. it was augmenting like background vocals, especially. Right. Is, the it's band is not sweetening. singing. Yeah. yeah. Sweetening. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that Ableton kicked off from there. And then after that, um, I met Daniel Mitzeris who, uh, is in St. Vincent's camp. And this was like a big education for me. Um, I got referred to him cause he needed, a sub for a period because he was having a kid and um that's a super involved rig um he was everything was out of ableton at the time it, he was sending messages to any clark's uh, kemper to change patches and or even ties to change patches mm-hmm. and then uh, Choco the guitarist had a kemper too and a minotaur up by her that uh, the ableton rig would like take control of so sometimes you'd be playing bass sometimes she'd be playing bass Mm-hmm. Some patch changes. All the drums were coming out of Ableton from across the stage. And uh, Matt Johnson, amazing drummer, he had like twelve trigger pads, so it was, <laughs> it was a bunch of stuff. A lot of stuff uh, going on. Yeah, it's when the iConnect kind of came first came out, the four plus. So we were yeah, using that. yeah. Uh, 
I'm so, actually looking at buying one of the the iConnect Audio Four Pluses right now. I'm actually yeah. looking at doing that for myself. They're great, that was they are. like could not affordable. Be without it, yeah, they're, they're not that much. They're kicking yeah. ass right now. So, um, so Daniel taught me that whole rig and like blew my mind further on the Ableton stuff. And I definitely have him to thank for all of like my Ableton savviness. Yeah, I feel like he was doing stuff that it's now common knowledge, but like all the key rack stuff yeah um, he was what version would like that have been when uh, you first got on eight eight or nine oh yeah I think it was eight yeah that's when nine. i first jumped in was the early part of eight yeah mm -hmm. and i went to dub spot in uh, new york city are you familiar uh -huh. with that school they really were pretty instrumental for the youtube of ableton of live ableton. tutorials yeah yeah, yeah. Well, that was like yeah, five years ago now, so maybe, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> nice. Oh, and he was also, so the keys rig there, it was just a single 49-note controller, and there was no audio tracks for St. Vincent. It was just MIDI tracks, mm -hmm. like, sending out information. Um, but he was able to do the whole set on this 49 key, and it would just dynamically change, you know, as it goes through the songs, like, what zones and everything. Yeah. Um, and then the buffers at, like, 128, and everything's running off of that so it was like sweat dripping <laughs> <laughs> yeah right yeah for people listening right now who maybe aren't really familiar with the whole playback engineering side of things and what we're talking about uh the whole ableton live uh playback engineering thing has really become like its own full-time job position for a lot of people on major tours and a lot of people didn't realize that. I honestly didn't even realize that was like a full-time gig happening frequently for large tours until I met Laura, um, Laura Eskide, which is how we ended up meeting. Uh, took her master track class. That was like, what, five months ago or so, something like yeah. that. And uh, there were some great industry experts that have been doing it, like yourself, Peter, and other people came in and... Uh, basically just sat us down in a chair and and talked about like what it looks like to work with an artist on a major tour and taking all their tracks from the studio setting it up in Ableton Live to perform basically however the artist wants um and for somebody like Kanye can change every show <laughs> so yeah it's like like learning tons of workflows and tips and tricks to quickly set up tracks and be able to do redundancy which I think is a big staple for Laura in the way that she does it in her process, which is really great. A lot of the bands I was in, I was doing keys and playback. Like, playback engineers are getting way more common now. Mm -hmm. It used to be like a secret, you know, because back early days, you didn't want people to know you're using tracks. But nowadays, it's like, yeah, we're using tracks. Yeah, right. It's great. Like, yeah, exactly. So. And even, and even auto-tune. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, would you say that most vocalists or a lot of vocalists are using in some capacity like that you worked with at least I don't know if most uh laura's done way more of that than me like especially really? in like hip-hop genre stuff but like indie bands aren't doing yeah right um, and, and pop i guess more so would you yeah, say pop, pop and like urban music yeah yeah do um, you when you have used which is cool because you couldn't do that like three years ago two years ago sure or at least easily <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. I love um, the new Auto Tune Advanced mm -hmm. that came out not terribly long ago. I've used that for a couple people that I've done some playback with, and I think so. Pro? If you, yeah, yeah. The, and uh, Universal Audio came out with their own version of it too recently, oh, not that oh, long I ago. This. Okay, oh, I'm dude, still so. with the Terry stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. honestly, I haven't messed with Interas that much. I've been using the UAD version for the last year and a half or so. Um, but it's great because uh, if you use the IAC driver, you can automate it in the console before it hits Ableton Live, and that's less strain on the on the nice. doll. Yeah. yeah, that's always wow. fun. That, so, like, let's talk a little bit about you know for people who maybe are, this is kind of new to them. Say I was an artist and I came to you and I had say like a large tour and was like, I want you to take these tracks. Maybe I've got sixteen stems for each song or whatever, and I want you to import it into Ableton Live. Um, and I like what, how would you go about that process with that artist? Like, what does I mean, that typically it, look like? It totally depends on the artist. You know, some, some right. don't really know what that all entails. Some are like really involved, like the same Vincent. She was sure knows all of that stuff. So she was all about getting it perfect. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, ideally with a, a live situation, you figure out what, what do they want for the show to make it different than the record? 
you know, some mm. people just want the record, but um, like, what are you going to do in your live show that augments this? So, mm. and then what do we need from playback that's like necessary to have for to merge the two, you know, and that sometimes that's like loops or percussion things. Yeah. Uh, um, effectsy things, mm -hmm. uh, synthy things. If there's, you know, like 10 other tracks and you only have one keyboardist on tour, you know, yeah. So figuring out how to hybridize the band situation as opposed to having it hundred percent one way or hundred percent the other way. You know, mm -hmm. how do you, how are we going to make these exist together? So sure. The playback guy, that's his job to streamline that, you know? Yeah. So we, the production or creative or artist is the one who gets to just share the concepts. So. Right. So it's really the playback engineer's job just to make those concepts become a reality yeah. and how it's all performed live. Yeah. So, so, and then, so on a tour like that, I mean, you have the playback engineer, but um, there's also usually an MD or a musical director mm -hmm. and you've had some experience doing that as well. Right? Yeah. Uh, so talk about that role. Like if somebody doesn't really know what a musical director does, like what does that person do? It's a, like a band leader at its most basic, but they're the kind of the head that the artist can talk to about band issues or creative issues. It really depends on the artist, what that all entails. Like with Allo, he, he doesn't want to worry about the band situation. So mm -hmm. we would just kind of lead everything. And then other artists, um, like with Adam Lambert, he was very involved and we would we would be talking about set stuff and track levels and like EQ things and stuff each yeah. show. <laughs> yeah. Um, Do you find so, that refreshing for an artist who's yeah, like yeah. technical so you can it really can be, get what he wants? My favorite balance is when they understand it, but they also appreciate how like what it takes to do. Because if, yeah. if it's just like a kid in a candy store and they think they can... <laughs> ask for all these things and you know at some point like you run out of time or it's going to cause problems for the show um, yeah. Yeah. and um my best experiences have been when they know what's possible and they're excited about it but you know understand like what it takes yeah who are uh, some who are some of your favorite artists that you've worked with i really liked working with adam lambert he was really? i was not familiar with his music at all before working with him and then just the more we worked, he was, he was just like super respectful and involved. And, uh, it was a big challenge. Um, because he's very specific about some things, uh, musically. Um, yeah. I learned a lot through that, that like year and a half. He was a lot of fun. Uh, seven for St. for Daniel in St. Vincent was probably my favorite. That one. Yeah. Tons of fun. Cause it was like musically challenging, uh, intellectually, like every night, you know, you're just like, oh man, that was great. I kicked my ass, but that was fun. Or some other <laughs> yeah. gigs, like kick your ass, and you're like, oh gosh, I don't know if I can do that again. Yeah. Um, but every gig I've done, I've, you know, you learn something new, you get some new experience. So the next time it's easier or you're able to handle it with more grace or yeah. like, uh, the things that I went through in the Mariah band over seven years were so educational i think crucial to me learning how to handle so many different situations that don't come up in music school you know or right with like a smaller band just yeah ridiculous situations right i mean yeah look back and be like wow that's that's crazy but we made it <laughs> right still have a job uh, like um here would be an md playback thingy like um we we were in morocco and it was for a tv they were taping this concert huge concert um, and it was going to go out live and, uh, they wanted to have like a Moroccan drum ensemble, like play the intro of the That's show. Cool. And we had, you know, like you rehearse in back in LA and everything's set up and there's lights and it's very specific. Um, it's not like an improv band, but it's got a yeah. very specific flow to it. So, right. um, but that's, you know, the production wanted like, Hey, let's, let's get this involved. And, um, We've got three hours until, you know, airtime. So let's figure it out. So the Moroccan band shows up and they're, they're incredible. Like, I wish I just had loops and loops and loops of all their stuff. It had so <laughs> You're much sitting vibe. there just hitting record and it was yeah. like, like, it's going to be a great sample pack later. Just like. Yeah. But, you know, like their time is not on a click. There, it's It goes uh, up and down all uh, over yeah. the place. And they're so... First, we tried to like record it with a set of mics because we were going to pre-record it and line it up with the show, um, and that did not work because you know, 
I'm coming to them and like trying to screw up their game. Yeah, right. What's a click? What like, who's this guy? <laughs> no. So, um, we recorded them at Soundcheck, and like the drummer was trying to direct them to like be in some sort of BPM time. Yeah. Um, took those stems, ran back to the hotel, and like edited like a madman and stretched and pulled and a lot of warping. Probably, yeah, a lot of warping. Uh, but got that together and threw it into the show so that when we did the show, they were just, they were playing live, but they weren't they were more or less miming to themselves. Okay. That's the only way that would have worked. So they were playing on top of basically yeah. what they already, yeah. I gotcha. That could be, that could sound crazy if the monitoring yeah. wasn't set right for them. Yeah. But you know, the TV feed was tracks of them from a couple hours prior. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, quote unquote fixed, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, um, but that's, Drum lines. yeah, that was just like a crazy situation to walk into, but we made it work, you know, yeah. um, there was another one with Aloe where we showed up and they wanted like the, uh, the glee choir of Texas university or something. And creative was like, yeah, we want to have this as the open of the show. Cause we were playing at that university or, or whatever. And yeah. uh, it was also a TV thing. And so we, creative is just like make this happen and i'm like okay well now i gotta let's figure this out so i we were gonna do a pre-record and so we set up two mics uh they're singing to click in silence you know and they're not good I like the team this disaster <laughs> so, a lot of auto tune yeah so uh yeah recorded them and stretched and fixed and layered over some samples and then same thing you know mm -hmm. it all had to happen really fast yeah uh, but if you don't know your DAW, you know, if you don't know how to yeah. handle that, that could be like a disaster, a time wasting, money wasting disaster. But totally. Hey, here's the situation. Make it work. Boom. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Hey guys, this is the part where I interrupt the podcast to remind you, if you haven't checked out Pigments yet, Arturia's new plugin, at some point, either now or later, go click on that link in the show notes, get the free download of Pigments, play with it. Um, it's about $200, so definitely worth it to add to your arsenal and have a huge library of creativity with a really cool synth that can do a lot of things. Check that out. Link in the show notes. Thanks for listening, and let's get back to it. That's kind of like in the master track class with Laura, that, that was a lot of the training we had. It's like, how fast can you work? How quick yeah. can you think? Mm -hmm. And it, not even not even just on a technical editing level and live, but like an interpersonal level. Like the, uh -huh. last day, the last day we had some band come in and they had them bark orders at us and we had to be able to like deal with the stressful situation of yeah. like de dealing with an artist. I mean, it was all like a play scenario, but like the artist was like, kind of a diva and <laughs> like that's asking good. all these good perfect example that's yeah exactly you just yeah. gotta be like oh yeah everything's great this, you know, this is awesome mm -hmm. well because yeah. you can have all the technical stuff but unless mm -hmm. you know how to apply i mean it's like recording with an artist or recording right. with and like totally so what if you know the technical manuals for your console or whatever i mean know that but then you really are dealing with people in that situation and right if you flub that then doesn't matter if you know that the input impedance with the you know and my cc's are flying all over here and yeah yeah matter. You're like you're in the business of people so if you right. don't know how to work with them it doesn't matter and that's very well said that is true it is the business of people mm -hmm. and I, I think a lot of industries are like that but especially with music and even not even just in a playback scenario but like i do a lot of like mixing and mastering for some other artists and you know, when I have the final result and I show it to them, if they listen to it over and over and over and over and over, then like a lot of times they hear it so much that they're just, they just like make up things in their head that need to yeah. be fixed. And you just kind of have to kind of roll with it and manage the expectation of like, yeah, I think that snare sounds really great. Like try to get them not to listen to it for the 20th time. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, and yeah, move that's on. People management. That's not, <laughs> totally. or the other classic is, you know, they made a demo in GarageBand or something and they come to you, produce it. And they're so attached to like the snare that was, you know, that they pulled up because they've listened to it a thousand times. So if uh, you did anything different, it's like whoa. But exactly, yeah. That's why I don't cool. even I don't even master my own projects that I produce from the ground up because of that. Because it's like smart. Yeah. You hear it over and over and over, and you just want to jump off a cliff after you know ma mastering <laughs> it at the very end of the day. Yeah. Which isn't good for anybody. Like as far as using live, you do you. Are you in live twenty four seven? Is like is yeah, that your I or do you use anything um, else? 
I sometimes go to Logic because that's my other. Um, yeah. Sometimes for like uh, orchestral stuff because having the key switch is not be lined up and quantized, you know, like, or sometimes even with those libraries, like the sample is actually late. So mm -hmm. everything kind of has to, since it's less grid based, I logic sometimes helps me there, but otherwise I'm in Ableton. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Um, the, yeah. the thing I've been running into lately is um, I've been doing more like uh, film, TV, media scoring stuff. And, you know, Ableton has a blind spot for time code and yeah. video a bit. I so think. do you, do you import like the actual edited video into live and then just score around it? Is that uh, kind of yeah, when I'm doing when I'm doing something where I feel like uh, live is important to use, like usually if it's more electronic based, you know, live yeah. is like my comfort zone. So yeah. I'll put the video in live, score to that, and then sometimes move it to Logic or Pro Tools to do the the other bit. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I've done a little bit of that, but I've always been fascinated with getting more into editing and scoring for film. I feel like from a producer standpoint, there could be good money in that a little more so than working yeah. with the indie <laughs> band scene, you know? Yeah. At least totally. you work with the right film or TV. I mean, there's just like any of the other avenues of music. There's a lot of guys working in there now, but um, yeah, I, I've enjoyed it. And like some people like working with artists. I more than I do. Like they, they have the, like I said, the, the people bit, you know, yeah. it's like scoring, um, you're still working with directors and producers, but um, it's not somebody's. I'm not breathing down your neck as much, like in the yeah, studio. They might be, but um, yeah, yeah, it's just different. I think I feel like it's a little different. Yeah, um, or if it's, like some of the ad stuff I've done, it's definitely not like this is their song baby that they've worked on for ten years. No, it, you know, this, they just want a good jingle. Yeah, and they yeah. they know what works and what doesn't. So, um, totally. In fact, some of my pals uh, from. Passion Pit, Xander Singh, and oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I've they, met those guys. They're great guys. So they, they you are. Know, they, they're fun. Their faces of the Passion Pit. Ian was a founding member, and um, they both now do scoring full time, like big, big stuff for Netflix and Apple TV. And uh, oh, Ian's nice. had some features. Um, yeah, they were like screw scoring. Um, doing scoring. In there. Yeah, I feel like it's a fun, creative field because you're not just like tied into one genre you have to like get creative and really create the sound that fits whatever the visual is which could be mm -hmm. all kinds of different things so it's like kind of yeah. fun i've uh, enjoyed my little taste of it I yeah like i had uh for example there was a i i my first real take of doing something like that was actually pretty recent and it was for this place called Ezra's Enlightened Cafe. It's like this Buddhist, like vegan restaurant. So, like, I've never had experience scoring like Middle Eastern stuff, and like, uh -huh. I found some crazy didgeridoo sounds and like chopped them up, and that's like the sound design part. That's like super fun and nerdy for me. Yeah, I love that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you wouldn't necessarily get to do that on like a yeah. project or something. Totally not. Totally <laughs> not. So. Uh, what are some of the most, I guess, like common technical issues that you've run into going back a little bit to like playback engineering, like an, on a tour or like setup? I guess, I guess the like the stuff that just is all the time is like either changing keys, changing tempos, or doing transitions for for artists. Um, and you could have all your Ableton stuff all nice and neat, but as soon as you get into the rehearsal room and start editing, like it, it's a disaster by the end of the night if you're not careful. So. Um, yeah. I've gotten in the habit of all just like duplicate the whole song on the timeline. This is all in arrangement to go. Um, just duplicate it and uh, then go edit that second version, but you still have your first version available because the artist might be like, oh, everything I just said for the last three hours, forget that. No, I want to <laughs> go back to the other one. And you're like, ah, oh. That's a lot of Command Z at that point. Yeah, that's a lot of Command Z, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's still there, unaffected. Yeah. You know, don't touch your channel strip volume settings. Like, you know, yeah. leave yourself some some safe spaces to, to revert to. Totally. So that's a that's a common one. Or like when you're stitching two songs together because they want to transition. You know, maybe later they decide they don't want those songs to be playing one into the other. They want them separate. And if you've stitched the only versions in your timeline, then you know, jumping back to another one's going to be problematic. So just duplicate it. Go work on it. You know further down the timeline right that's like the easiest right. safety tip 
So you're pretty much most of the time in arrangement view then? When yeah, you're I, yeah, I do arrangement view because like, especially in rehearsals um, and especially if time is uh, an issue where you don't have tons and tons of days with the band, you got three days to throw a you know, 70 minute tour set yeah. together. Um, you got to be quick. So it's like, well, we just want to work on the bridge. You got to start from the bridge. You can't, if you're in session view, you know, that gets problematic. Yeah. I like, okay, I'm going to start you guys two bars before the second verse. Okay, one, two, three, four, go. You know, um, yeah. an arrangement view allows you all that flexibility uh, yeah. more so than session view. So, mm-hmm. session view is, uh, I feel like in my situations, once stuff's dialed in and it's dummy proof, and if it's a band where things aren't going to change, which sometimes is the case, then session view is great because yeah. it takes out potential for so many other things but that's sure that's yeah great. just launch that scene and just away yeah, you go launch that scene. and if like yeah. if the drummer's launching playback because they they're a smaller budget then you know make it as easy and streamlined as possible so. right mm-hmm. yeah and the uh consolidate time to new scene is a really great feature too for that for that kind of thing mm-hmm. for anybody listening you just highlight the however much time you want right click consolidate time new scene it'll take everything and all the automation and arrangement and just throw it into a scene in session view which is always nice so pro tip for the day for all the listeners uh, I'll take that one that's nice yeah yeah thomas folds actually shared that with me so you could do all and i that's what i used to do actually before i and and was always doing session view until um which you know about like set list pro I'm mm-hmm. sure you're familiar with that. Yeah. Which uh, by Strange Electronics. And yeah. You can just rename the locator in arrangement view for anybody listening. And then you can uh, have like this. It's a Max for Live device. And you just can launch individual locators and MIDI map them and get pretty creative with that. So uh, do you use that for when you do playback? I haven't been using it just because it's more recent and I haven't mm-hmm. been doing as much like playback mm-hmm. stuff lately. Uh, okay. But I'm sure I would have used it. Like uh, my Adam Lambert rig, I was doing keys, uh, band leader, and playback. So I had three laptops on stage, two redundant oh, wow. playback ones, and then a soft synth rig. Because uh, it was also like 100% soft synth because it was all EDM and stuff. Yeah. Um, and so I was using an iConnect with Touch OSC on my iPad to jump around uh, stuff. Nice. Yeah, Setlist would have uh, made that a lot easier. So. Yeah, yeah, Touch OSC. That's been around for a little while, uh-huh. though, hasn't it? Yeah, that's like a hidden gem. I feel like yeah. a lot of people don't even know about. If I had an iPad, I probably would have used that before. Uh huh. Well, and but. I've been on like smaller band things where I'll just use my iPhone. You know, if it's like a five song set with an indie band, uh-huh. nice. You don't want to be, you know, face down in a laptop. You can yeah set my iPhone on the Nord and just be like oh. yeah. Make sure your <laughs> make sure your phone's charged. Yeah, make sure your phone's. Charged. <laughs> That'd be a bummer. I want an eye message popping up when you're supposed to trigger. Yeah, right. Bing! Just plays through the speakers. That'd be a bummer. Yeah. Well, so what advice would you give to somebody maybe who's wanting to do what you do, say, like, as a, either a playback engineer or just, like, playing on a tour doing this kind of technical setup for artists? Like, how would somebody even go about getting started with something like that? Well... I've had a long journey. But, right. Um, You've been doing it for a while, obviously. <laughs> but yeah. I think the most crucial points, you know, for me was like the synth obsession. I, I dove headfirst into it and I really knew it. I remember I had a, I was trying to be like more keyboardist for every genre out of school. Like, oh, I can do that. I can do that. And I had a buddy who told me like, no, be, you know, be that guy or be this guy. Like be the synth guy. Or mm. if you find a niche that's your, that you're able to explore more than, um, I think you can get more out of that because we're not, we're all going to be, we're not going to be masters of everything, you know, jack of all trades, yeah. master of none. So right. if you choose some lanes to specialize in, then um, I think you'll start getting more work. Uh, other side of that, you know, learn, keep learning all the other stuff too. Yeah. Like if I had never learned playback stuff or if I had not jumped into Ableton uh, after, you know, like I said earlier, seeing folks using it at festivals, like, you know, the last four years of employment, all of that was so crucial to the work I've had in the last few years. Which yeah. me, you know, coming as a keyboardist and being like, I'm going to learn this other skill to add to my collection. You know, yeah. I'm still 
excelling in my niche, but I, I'm adding another niche. So. Sure. Like necessary skills to build off yeah. of the foundation that you yeah, already absolutely. have in your niche. Yeah. Stay hungry, you know, keep learning. And like, especially with Ableton, there's a hundred different ways of doing things. So I, you know, right. and I hear, I'll hear people talk about it and how they're doing stuff and take what I can from that and, you know, maybe inject it into what I'm doing. Yeah, totally. That's cool, man. Like I, I like your website. I'm actually looking, oh, at, her, <laughs> looking at it right now for the third time, and it's very clean. I need to update mine. Oh. But, but for anybody who's wanting to, I guess, stay connected with you and, and like future happenings of what you're doing, uh, where where would you tell them to Can go? Can you mail me through the website peterdyer.net or um, follow me on Instagram peterkeys88? Just hit me up. And yeah, I had a guy hit me up about a patch I used on a demo and. Uh, he was just asking what the settings were. Yeah, you know, like if I got time, absolutely. Happy to help. Yes. Spread, spread the synth knowledge. Yes, do it. You're making the world a better place. <laughs> no harm in asking. Right. Yeah, man, honestly, I could always use more patches, like for all of my synths and my Sub-37 too as well. bunch of Are presets you... for the Sub-37 of mine on the Moog site, so you can download Oh, them. nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll definitely go check that out for yeah. sure. They're on the wackier side because they wanted me to focus on the looping envelopes at the time. But okay. yeah, there's like 50 presets of kind of out there stuff. So I'm all into I like the weird stuff. Yeah. So it's that's good. what the Moog site is. So. Cool. Yeah, man. Well, everybody, if uh, if you're listening right now, check out the show notes and we'll have links to like your Instagram and your website, peterdyer.net. That's D Y E R, in case you're wondering. Um, and yeah, dude, thank you. I'll respect your time. I know you've got other stuff to do today and like, this has been fun. Like I could sit here and nerd out with you for another like 12 and a half hours. (laughs) Um, but yeah, man, this is, this is cool. Thank you for joining the podcast. Uh Definitely, definitely be in touch. I'm going to go check out those presets on the site and download those and play with those later tonight and get weird with it. It'd be fun. Cool, man. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for joining the podcast. And, uh, yeah, maybe we'll have you back at another time sometime down the road. Thanks, Dan. Sweet. Yeah, man. Take it easy. This podcast is sponsored by LiveProducersOnline.com, a community of Ableton Live users connecting you to the pros to learn today's music production.